So under the name, rank, and serial number rules of the Stegner Gestapo, uh, I am required to limit my uh, introduction of T. Destry Jarvis to uh, the name, rank, and serial number. Um, and I don't usually comply with rules real well, uh, and this will be one occasion uh, again for them to reconsider my status. Uh, but don't worry, it won't be long. Uh, the speaker is T. Destry Jarvis, um, president of the uh, NGO, Outdoor Recreation and Park Services uh, Organization. Um, my reflection, which I'd ask you to sort of keep in front of you as you listen to the strategist and uh, political savvy uh, that uh, Mr. Jarvis can offer us is to keep in mind um, the, the parallel picture of him as I saw him uh, uh, hiking among the smoldering stumps in uh, Yellowstone National Park and breathing in those vapors with enthusiasm for the uh, development that we now know has followed beautifully in Yellowstone. T. Destry Jarvis. So um, I'm supposed to talk about parks, politics, and partnerships, and I will talk about each of those things, but also try to make the point that they are inextricably linked. Um, I also have to offer a slight uh, clarification or disclaimer and maybe indulge too much into my own uh, bio to be sure that you don't think of me like Billy Beer in the 70s. I see not too many people remember the uh, Carter administration and his older brother um, causing much grief for the president. Um, and so let me say that I have spent 42 years, 45 years in Washington, D.C., three of which was in the Army. Um, my last year was in Vietnam. And then 42 years in public policy advocacy for the national parks. Uh, I spent 16 years at National Parks Conservation Association, or as Vice President for Policy. And PCA is an organization that would like to think of itself as a partner, but is really more of an advocate and somewhat independent from the Park Service. Uh, I spent four years as Executive Vice President of Student Conservation Association, which is an organization that recruits young people who hopefully, they hope, will become the next generation of conservationists, employees of the Park Service, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife, et cetera. Um, it is a true partner in my definition of that term with the National Park Service and has been since its inception in 1957. Uh, I spent eight years in the Clinton administration as assistant director of the National Park Service, political, non-career, senior executive, uh, appointee. Um, I ran the Congressional Affairs Office, the Public Affairs Office, the Tourism Office, and the Partnership Office. Um, uh, but I was not in the Park Service. I was perhaps of the Park Service, but continued my public policy advocacy. The, one of the two directors I worked for once told me that I should dissemble more um, when I was berating um, several other employees of the Park Service. Um, and the, uh, I then spent two years as executive director of National Recreation and Park Association, which likes to think of itself as a professional society of park employees, mostly state and local. Um, I did not stay there long because they hired me to make them more active in public policy and then decided they did not want to be. Um, at that point, my wife of 33 years retired from EPA, and I sat at my own consulting practice, called out the Recreation of Park Services. And many of my clients are the same suspects that I had worked for before, NPCA, uh, the Wilderness Society, Natural Resource Defense Council, Student Conservation Association, uh, and so forth. Um, during my tenure as a consultant, I've worked for Booz Allen Hamilton when they've had government contracts and needed subject matter expertise. I've done some work for Aramark as a consultant who's a Park Service concessionaire. But most of my work has been with 
uh, NGOs who are advocates for particular places or aspects of the mission of the National Park Service. Um, I have also served on a number of nonprofit boards of directors, uh, including uh, the American Hiking Society, the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics, um, the City Parks Alliance, uh, and others that I will not mention. Let me say that um, since Jonathan is uh, director of the National Park Service, uh, when he became director, um, the ethics office, and we personally vowed to have little contact, and I have had less professional contact with him than any of the 11 previous directors of the National Park Service that preceded him, beginning with George Hartzog. Um, and to date myself, age myself even more, I did spend meaningful time with, um, uh, with Connie Worth before he died, um, uh, and with um, uh, at least one of his predecessors. Um, and I also think of myself as um, uh, an advocate for the park service as well as the park system. And that is a distinction that people often obscure. Um, they, are, they are very different. Uh, administrations change. Congresses change. I'll talk about politics a little bit first. Every four or eight years, administrations turn over. Every time there is a new president, a new secretary of the interior, a new assistant secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, a new director of the Park Service, there are sometimes wild and other times subtle shifts in priority, emphasis, policy, uh, and the way politics affects the management decision making of the National Park Service. Um, we have had, and, and I will say too that that happens with changes at the senior management, CEO level of conservation organizations. Um, my own NPCA, uh, Anthony Wayne Smith, uh, was president when I started there. Um, he had been a labor lawyer in the old CIO and was more interested in world population uh, control than national parks. Um, the next CEO, Paul Pritchard, had been a political appointee in the Carter administration as deputy director of what was Bureau of Outdoor Recreation became Heritage Conservation Recreation Service. And, and during his time in the Carter administration, grew to hate the National Park Service. Um, not the National Park System, but the National Park Service. And that was manifest through his tenure at, at NPCA. Um, they then uh, came into an era of I think high quality leadership under Tom Kiernan and grew significantly um, to be the organization they are today. And now they have a brand new CEO whom I've not even yet met. Um, and I think there are these wild swings from good, badder, better, best to indifferent, uh, ignorant, opposed, and uh, diabolical change agents um, trying to affect the National Park Service. Um, it is, to me, um, essential, uh, and I'll make this point several times, that partnerships exist, that partnerships are strengthened, that partnerships flourish, because I truly believe the National Park Service cannot be uh, in an excellent uh, frame of reference to the American people and maybe cannot even survive in coming decades without strong partnerships. Um, I, I think there are things that partners do for the Park Service politically, uh, in fundraising, in advocacy, uh, in public education that it at least has not done for itself very effectively over the years. Um, and it's true of um, units of the National Park System. There are very few units of the National Park System, the 401 units that the Park Service itself can say we are the reason this is a unit of the National Park Service. Most units of the system come into the system through the advocacy of someone other than the National Park Service. Some one or some organization or some sets of organizations. Um, the Park Service has had since at least the uh, early 70s uh, a set of documents they call the National Park System Plan. They have a thematic framework for what should be in the National Park System. They have done um, in recent years, law, required by law, previously of their own initiative, studies of 
specific places that they would like to have included in the national park system. But actually getting them there is more a product of the work of partners than it is of the National Park Service itself. Um, I will also say that the Park Service does not have, has not had, and likely will not have enough money to do the job that Congress has set out for it to do without the work of its partners. Um, I think there are at least four types of partners, and I'll break them down. People, that word partnership or park partnership is more abused than any other word in Washington as far as I'm concerned, but there are, um, I mean, the contractors would like to call themselves partners, the concessionaires would like to call themselves partners, uh, advocacy NGOs would like to call themselves partners, um, and you can stretch the definition to include those, um, and, and for some of this presentation I may as well, but they generally are not partners. Um, to me, partnership is a two-way street. Um, it requires some give and take on both sides. It requires some active participation uh, for a common goal, not just a goal to benefit the individual organization that is calling itself a partner. Um, so let me say that the, probably the first most traditional uh, partner uh, are what were called the cooperating associations. These were the NGOs chartered by the Park Service in most cases or at their instigation who uh, run the bookstores in the parks, who sell educational materials, and who take their profits and donate them back to interpretation and research in the national parks. Um, if you buy publications in Park Service interpretive centers, visitor centers, you're buying it from the cooperating association. Uh, and there, by, by law and practice, their profits go back to the National Park Service. Some of those, over time, mostly in the last 20 or 30 years, have evolved. And they have, in the 70s in particular, there was a big move um, and, and really came into its own in the 80s um, as budgets began to get cut by um, the Reagan administration in particular. Um, the Park Service looked around and said, we got to find more money. We got to find people to raise more money for us. So we're gonna encourage either the establishment of new park friends, funds, or foundations, or conservancies, or encourage a particularly effective cooperating association to convert itself into being more than just a bookstore operator. So the best example, the largest, the most successful, the uh, National uh, Park Conservancy, Golden Gate Conservancies, um, uh, at Golden Gate National Recreation Area in San Francisco, that conservancy started out as the Cooperating Association. It has now raised hundreds of millions of dollars um, for that park, um, largely raised in San Francisco and, and California a little more broadly. Um, they've done incredible things that the Park Service could not have done for itself. The Park Service benefited from having um, the most entrepreneurial superintendent at the time that the Park Service has ever had in Brian O'Neill. Um, he talked about friend raising, not fundraising, um, and really established the conservancy, uh, which has fortunately had a consistent executive director for most of its successful years, um, as a very effective partner in a whole bunch of different ways that didn't exist before they, come in, they came into their own. Some of the others, um, and, and I, let me say one thing about those kinds of organizations. Um, in 1986, um, I was invited to Acadia National Park because uh, a group was forming called Friends of Acadia, and uh, there was still a, another type of superintendent even more prevalent than the Brian O'Neill type superintendent um, who said, if I'm gonna have this organization, I'm gonna control it. I'm gonna write into the bylaws that they cannot do anything that I don't ask them to do. Um, and the, the then uh, 
president of the board of that organization invited me up to try to convince the superintendent to think otherwise. And we did in the end because I said to him, look, the first time something happens with this organization that, that comes back in the media or through the Congress or some other source uh, that, that they don't like about what's happening in this park, you will get the blame whether you had anything to do with it or not because you have the veto power over what they do. So he agreed to take that requirement out of their bylaws. Um, and in the Acadia, Friends of Acadia is another very successful NGO partner that was never a bookstore. Um, they uh, raise money. Um, and I, here's a place where I can talk about the evolution of the parks as well as partners because Acadia is unique in that it was formed by an NGO who got donations of land, uh, went to President Woodrow Wilson and said, we will donate this land to the federal government if you will make it a national monument under the Antiquities Act. And they did that twice. He did two different proclamations. And then when the third time when they had land to donate, um, the Congress stepped in and said, okay, we'll, do, uh, we'll legislate a national park. Uh, and, and they did so. Um, and there have been some units established that way, um, but not, not too many. Um, so there are many types of interagency partnerships as well. Uh, probably the most current, somewhat modern, although I'm dating myself, it's 20 years ago, um, when I was assistant director of the Park Service, went to California, we signed a, uh, a cooperative agreement between California uh, Natural Resources Agency and the National Park Service for the joint management of California Redwood national and state parks up on the north coast. Three big state parks that actually had most of the virgin old growth. Um, Redwood National Park had been expanded uh, in 1978 um, with a bunch of cutover land and the Park Service was uh, inventing restoration process as well as policy in the restoration of those lands, but the real, most of the real old growth was in the state parks. So now we, we signed this agreement and there's essentially no boundary. All the signs say national and state parks, all the interpretation is, is joint, all the resource management is joint, there's a joint maintenance yard that superintendents are in the same building and adjacent offices. Um, it is really a seamless concept uh, and it works. It, it's, when California's budget has been going through the throes it did uh, 10 years ago and more recently, um, it was the National Park Service that was keeping the state parks open. But the budgetary reason is not the primary reason to do this or the primary benefit. So beyond Redwood, that concept in California expanded to the state and national parks in the, in the Bay Area around Golden Gate and into uh, the, the Los Angeles area around Santa Monica Mountains and even out in the desert um, around Mojave National Preserve and um, the Zizek's Research Station and some uh, other state parks in the, uh, in the desert. And so they share staff, money, knowledge, uh, management planning processes, and so forth. And it uh, is a more efficient and effective way to manage a, lar a truly large landscape. There are probably, uh, I've done a count of this, another 75 or 80 places around the country where the Park Service and adjacent state parks, or in some cases adjacent city parks, could be doing something very similar to be more efficient, more effective, um, build political constituency, um, and uh, carry out the Organic Act's mandate in, in more effective ways. Um, and I, I truly think that should be pursued. You know, we've seen administrations, interestingly, the last Republican administration and the current Democratic administration both talk in terms of large landscape conservation. Um, when Gail Norton was secretary, she talked in terms of uh, cooperative conservation, but looking at large landscapes of intergovernmental public-private um, adjacency. And the Obama administration did this very elaborate process to come up with America's Great Outdoors plan, 
um, and talks in terms of large landscape conservation strategies as well. And they've identified Crown of the Continent and Greater Yellowstone and some other places um, as these large landscapes where they want to foster collaboration and cooperation. And I would say it, it's, uh, the jury is out on how successful that will be um, because they haven't really put the resources to it that it needs. That those ideas actually go back into the 60s, uh, the 1962 Outdoor Recreation Resources Review Commission report to Congress, um, which was probably the most important single thing of its type in the 20th century. Um, ha it, it included recommendations for the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act, the Wilderness Act, the Wild and Sink Rivers Act, the National Trail System Act, um, the Outdoor Recreation Act, and a bunch of other proposals that have become law shortly thereafter. It also recommended interagency large landscape cooperative management planning, which agencies have largely not done. But we're in a place now where more and more of that seems doable uh, and desirable. Um, there is a tool that they don't use um, to make this work. It's called the SCORP, the Statewide Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan. It is a requirement of the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act for the stateside grants uh, of that program. LWCF is revenue derived from Outer Continental Shelf oil and gas leasing receipts. $900 million a year of that is put into a fund in the Treasury, not, unfortunately, a trust fund uh, like the Highway Trust Fund, um, but subject to appropriation. And a portion of that goes to the states. The states are required to do a comprehensive plan, but the feds and the states never get together when that plan is being done. It's like there's a firewall between them. And so if they would reinterpret the law, which they can very well do, uh, in my humble opinion as a biologist and not a lawyer, um, that the SCORP is the vehicle by which large landscape planning with state leadership can be done and get at some of these efficiencies and collaborative things that will tamp down the politics and elevate the biology and the science to make public land management across the West you know, better, for, better for all of us. Um, another example, I think an emerging trend, although it's been emerging for a long time, um, the best example across the national park system of a partner that is actually a management partner is the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. Um, the Appalachian Trail, Maine to Georgia, 2,185 mile uh, path through 14 states, um, started off in Benton Mackay's thesis um, as a uh, vision of regional recreation planning, not just a trail tread that you walk on. Um, and now we're getting to a place where it can be viewed in that way very effectively. The Park Service, shortly after the National Trust System Act was enacted in 1968, the Park Service entered into an agreement with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy to be the management partner. It was, there was no way the Park Service was going to staff a 2,185 mile trail in 14 states. But there were 36 trail clubs, largely of volunteers, uh, who do the trail maintenance, do the patrol. They have a, called the, the, the uh, Ridge Runner program of uh, engagement with hikers on the trail. Um, they have trail towns. They do all kinds of collaborative things. But it is the ATC and not the National Park Service that manages the Appalachian Trail. The Park Service has a superintendent. They have one law enforcement officer. Um, they have a GIS specialist and, and some mapping capability. They do law enforcement and uh, planning. They write the management plan, but ATC does everything else. And there's some money that transfers hands. The ATC raises a bunch of money. Some money goes from the Park Service appropriation to the ATC to facilitate the work of the trail volunteers up and down the trail. I think there are more places around the national park system where we will move in that direction um, rather than the command and control era of park management that was so prevalent in the 50s when uh, most of the employees of the National Park Service had been, were veterans of, of World War II, who themselves were veterans of the Civilian Conservation Corps, uh, as my father was, um, 
And there was this period when the Park Service believed um, that only it could manage the parks. Only it could uh, understand what was needed to find that right balance uh, between preservation and use. And I think we've moved into an era now where there's another generation uh, managing the parks and they get the idea of partnership. Brian O'Neill was just the best manifestation of that, but there are young managers in the Park Service today who would not think of uh, taking actions or issues without engaging their partners in, in the community. And I think that's where we have to be. There's another aspect of this that I'll mention and then I'll stop. Um, Park Service has probably 1,500 to 2,000 historic buildings under its care, under its responsibility to maintain that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places, uh, but which they do not have the money to care for. And they are most, these buildings that I'm referring to are mostly not places that they use for interpretation, that they occupy for offices or visitor centers. They're just historic buildings that are there on the landscape. Beautiful to view, important to interpret from outside, but they can be leased and they have the authority under the National Historic Preservation Act to lease those to a third party who will manage them compatibly, um, but pay for the maintenance themselves. So that comes off the books of the Park Service. This $11 billion uh, backlog of unfunded maintenance that the Park Service has accumulated includes the cost of maintaining those buildings. Well, that ba backlog could be reduced if somebody else was responsible. Um, and so I think there's many, many opportunities to create those kinds of, of really useful partnerships. Um, I think my time is up, so I have some more things to say, but I'll stop and see if there's one or two questions. Time for two questions. Yes, sir. Well, not in every case, certainly, but you know that most of the early national parks were carved out of the public domain. They were. They've always public land. They were never on the private tax rolls. Um, and so the early parks, the Yellowstones, the Yosemites, and so forth, um, were public domain lands transferred from the General Land Office to the National Park Service by an act of Congress. When the Antiquities Act came in, it authorized the president to proclaim national monuments, again, only from existing public lands. The monument authority does not extend to private lands. So, this was a transfer from the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service to the National Park Service by presidential proclamation. It wasn't until the Cape Cod National Seashore legislation was enacted in 1964 that for the first time the Congress directed the National Park Service to purchase privately owned lands for establishment of a national park. Um, and then the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act passed in 65 that actually gave them the money to do that with. Uh, and so uh, the system has evolved greatly from the public domain and in the West exclusively to the East. Um, in the years between Land and Water Fund Act and um, the Antiquities Act, the parks that were established in those years, like Mammoth Cave and Shenandoah and Great Smokies and Acadia, were all acquired from private lands by somebody other than the federal government and donated to the National Park Service. Um, in the case of Smokies, Shenandoah, and Mammoth Cave, resulting in acts of Congress to establish those national parks. In the case of Acadia, because there were so many rich people with lots of land on Mount Desert Island um, who were conservation-minded, they actually donated their lands through the Hancock County Trustees of Reservations, who then went to the president and, and he said, if you donate this land, I will proclaim it a national monument. So one of the most recent ones that, that President Obama has done is Fort Monroe on the coast of Virginia, known as Freedom's Fortress. Um, and it 
was state land. It was, it was state land donated by the state to the Army for an Army base for many, for more than a century. Um, then when BRAC closed the Army base, the land reverted to the state of Virginia. And then the governor of Virginia said to the president, I will donate this to you, to the American people, if you'll proclaim a national monument. So it can happen multiple ways. Um, private lands can be acquired and donated and then a proclamation made. Private lands can be acquired and donated and Congress can pass legislation. We're just in a Congress right now where they don't pass anything. So the president, out of, mostly out of frustration, um, has waited around for a while. In the case of Fort Monroe, the Republican-dominated uh, House of Representatives delegation from Virginia put in a bill to make Fort Monroe a legislated national monument. Congress didn't act. The president did, because he has the authority to act. Um, so the politics evolves, and the system evolves. And we have many different types of units in the system, as, as the previous speaker referred to today. They're not as pristine as the ones carved out of the public domain in most cases, even though they are still governed by the Organic Act's uh, mandate to conserve unimpaired for enjoyment. Anybody else? Yes, sir. I believe that the concept of the, the, concept of the landscape uh, conservation cooperatives grew out of you know, that idea of stakeholdership. Uh, not only between federal agencies, but also you know, between federal agencies, NGOs, and universities. However, those cooperatives seem to be on the slow burner at the moment. How do you see their future? Well, I think the big thing is in an era when budgets are really tight, it demands, if people want to move forward, it demands collaboration. And so I think there are some really good opportunities across the landscape today for the Park Service and a sister agency to collaborate. And when they do, that often loosens the purse strings in Congress because it isn't just an exclusive federal thing because members of Congress in particular positions of power as chairman of the Appropriations Subcommittee or, or of the National Park Subcommittee um, say, this actually works and is beneficial to my constituency. You know, what, one of the problems in Congress right now is that we don't have the, the really good, high quality, committed leaders to national parks that we had in the 70s and the 80s. We don't have John Cyberling or Phil Burton or Bruce Vento uh, or Scoop Jackson, um, the people that enacted most of the laws that, that I've participated in over 42 years um, aren't there anymore. And the people that are in charge come and go really fast um, and don't develop the knowledge uh, in their leadership positions. Um, that is needed to win the day when they're arguing for new legislation. Uh, but I think the, the large landscape idea is one that's now here to stay. Um, and it may be on slow burn at the moment because anything that takes legislation is on slow burn. Um, but I think the agencies are doing a better job of collaborating amongst themselves than they have historically. And that's, that's a good thing in my view.